Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Professor Mike, and welcome to today's lesson of uh, oral communication presentations. Um, for this week, I want to talk about three things. I would like to talk about nonverbal communication, uh, such as hand gestures, uh, standing, um, eye contact, voice, all that kind of stuff. I've got a great video I want to show you today by David J. Phillips. David J. Phillips is one of the best presenters uh, in the world. Um, I use his videos very often. Uh, he's very simple to, very, I mean, his presentations are so good. Uh, you'll have no problems uh, understanding and uh, you will see how effective or how he can teach us how to really give an effective presentation. Uh, the other thing is I want to talk about attire. What do we wear for a presentation? Uh, even if it's a video presentation as well, although that's not too, too important, but it can be, of course. Uh, and then finally, uh, some of the problems that might happen like during a presentation and how we can find solutions and minimize these problems. In fact, how we can avoid the problem altogether, even be you know, even before the presentation begins, just so that that, that, that certain problem uh, doesn't arise. Okay, I'm just going to go for, uh, show you a few things so that um, from a PowerPoint presentation uh, that I want you to, dis to discuss with you, and that's regarding the presentation itself. So hang on a second, I'm just going to transfer. So try to remember that your presentation topic now the topic of your presentation is completely up to you, okay? Uh, I've said that before, uh, at least during the class, but for the external students who are wondering what they should present about, well, I leave that up to you because uh, the topic is not all that, I mean, it's rel relevant, of course, but uh, this is about the presenta presentation techniques, uh, speaking in English, uh, and so on. Okay, so in fact, actually, the content is uh, secondary. It's less less important than your style of presentation and your delivery of the presentation. So you can make a presentation about your work. You can whatever you're doing, uh, you know, in your office, in your laboratory, uh, in the field. Okay, it can be anything like that. It can be a hobby, something that you're interested in, something uh, political, something uh, about the universe, whatever you like, uh, it's up to you. You choose the, the topic, okay? Now make sure that your topic is uh, around 10 minutes, or at least minimum 10 minutes long, and try not to be longer than 15 minutes. Okay, now I really, really want to um, draw your attention here, okay? Uh, because of the uh, the writing course, okay, the uh, professional writing is online, uh, it means actually that I have a little bit more time on Thursday mornings, and uh, that means that if some of you want to do face-to-face -face presentations, like presentna forma, in the classroom, I, I believe that is possible, okay? So in, if you want to do face-to-face -face instead of a video presentation, uh, presentation, please send me an email. I think all of you have my email address, but I'm going to put it up there anyways, okay? So we can do it like so, okay? That means um, every Thursday, I'm generally free from 8 o'clock in the morning until 11.30. So those are like, you know, two 100-minute lessons. And that means I can have five people make a presentation in one 100-minute lesson. So that means that I can have 10 presentations in, in one morning, okay? Of course, you need to wear the face mask, okay? But th that's okay, though. It doesn't matter. It's a great way for students who would prefer to present this way, you know, the presentna forma, okay? Live, you know, uh, in the classroom. Uh, there will only be you know, five people, including yourself, plus me, so six people uh, at the uh, at your presentation. And uh, so it's completely legal. It's, I mean, you know, like we're respecting all the, the measures and everything and the health guidelines. 
you know, considering COVID-19. So again, if you are interested, send me that email, okay? Remember, there's my email, okay? And I will send you a date to do your presentation in November or December, okay? So it will take place after All Saints Day. Uh, I will figure out the times uh, and so on. And all you need to do is send me an email and say, Professor Mike, I would like to do a face-to-face -face presentation and I will send you an email back and ask you if that date is possible, okay? Great, okay then, so uh, let's get started then. Okay, so we're basically at unit eight, uh, nonverbal communication problems and attire. So if you can look at page 71 of the handbook, I've got it in front of me, so I'm just gonna flip the camera over and uh, we'll, we'll do a couple of pages from the book. And then I wanna show you that David J. Phillips video for you. It's, it's really... Okay then, so your body language is extremely important. Um, you know, because the words you speak, it includes the, the tone of your voice, the speed of delivery, uh, all that kind of stuff, okay? But it's more than just words, okay? It's actually about a, a lot of things. So uh, how should you stand, okay? Think about that. Should you stand with your arms crossed on your chest? Let me show you that there. All right, so arms are crossed like that on your chest, okay? Should you be standing like that? Ask yourself this. Should you be standing straight but relaxed or should your knees be unlocked? Okay, so that's a, a slouching move. Okay, let me show you slouching. Okay, so slouching would be here. Okay, so when you slouch, your back is bent your head is down, okay? This is the way you want to, to stand. All right, think also about your hands. Do you keep them placed on your hips, okay? Right, bulky. Do you put one hand or both of them in your pockets or do you just keep your hands by your side? Okay, so the, generally, yes, keep your hands by your side. Don't put it, your hands at, at all in your pocket, okay? Um, and placing them on your hips, okay, I'll show that to you. The thing about putting your hands, okay, on your hips, okay, even like this woman here, um, yeah, they don't look very happy. So you don't want to sound or you don't want to appear angry to your audience. All right, keep in mind about your the speed of your, your, your speaking, okay? So how fast should you speak, all right? Slower than normal, faster than normal, or your normal speed, okay? Some students have asked me about this before, okay? Some of them say you should speak a little bit slower. Yeah, okay, if you normally speak very quickly, Try to slow down just a little bit so that everybody or that each word is understandable to everyone. So don't try to speak uh, any faster, but if you can speak at your normal speed, okay, then that's, that's fine too, okay? Also be careful. What should you do if you feel nervous? Okay, do you hold a pen in your hands? Uh, do you walk back and forth, you know, you're going, uh, 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 okay, or do you look at the screen and avoid on eye contact with the audience? Well, okay, try not to do this. Try never to look at the screen, okay? The screen is your support. If you have a PowerPoint, uh, a Prezi, anything on a screen, okay, that's only to you know, illustrate your, your points. It's supposed to give you, you know, you provide charts and, and graphs and, and pictures for people to look at, okay? If you remember last week with Stefano Marcuso, okay? He had a screen, but he didn't look at it, okay? He looked at the audience. 
holding the pen in your hands is actually a really good idea. So if I have a, uh, you know, sometimes I just don't know what to do with my hands, okay? Uh, a pointer would be good, uh, but if you don't have a pointer, a pen is also handy. Just be careful that you don't point it at people or, or, or scratch your head with it or, or anything like that. But if you have the point in uh, or the, the pen in your in your hands, okay, you can illustrate points, okay? Uh, keep your hands open like this uh, at all times, okay? It means that you're open, you're welcome to uh, questions, okay? Uh, things like that, okay? And, and at least, you know, having the, the pen, it kind of gives you um, an anchor, like a code file or something like that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, to my passion and to my love and according to my wife, my mistress in life. Seven years ago, I embarked on a journey to analyze 5,000 public speakers from all over the world, amateurs and professionals, in order to distill and understand what makes a good speaker good, what makes a great speaker great, and what makes an outstanding speaker outstanding. The result? 110 core skills with loads of sub-skills. So what does it look like? It looks like this. These are the 110 core skills and the equation is simple. The more of them you fulfill, the greater you are. Now 110 skills, that's quite a tad too many to go through in one TED talk, don't you agree? So what I've done is I've picked out my absolute favorites and I'd like to show you a demonstration of what it can look like. Imagine that this chair is something that you want somebody else to believe in. You want somebody else to buy into this. This is your idea. This is you wanting to make your voice heard. This gives you two options. Either you're on this side of the chair and you're a fairly mediocre communicator. You shoot from the hip, you hope for the best. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Option number two is that you're on this side of the chair and you know exactly what you're doing in every instance of time. You know that by taking a step forward, you increase focus. You know that by tilting your head slightly to the side, you increase empathy. You know that by changing the pace of what you are saying, you increase focus. And you know that by shifting yourself lower, you increase trust. And you know that by lowering your voice, you get anticipation. And you know for absolute certain. that if you pause, you get absolute and undivided attention. Now the question then is, can everyone be on this side of the chair? Can everyone become good at these skills? What do you think the answer is? Of course it is. Why? Because it's called presentation skills, 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 skills. It is not, has never been, and shall never be called a talent. You're not born with a particular gene that makes you brilliant on stage. Something you acquire through life. Now, as I said, 110 skills, that's quite the number. So what I've chosen to do is I've picked out the five, would I say, most important skills. Whenever somebody comes to me and they want coaching, this is what I focus on. And then I'll actually give you four bonus skills at the end as well. Sounds okay? So let's start with two of my favorites from body language, which is skill 34 and skill 69. That is not intentional. <laughs> now 34, what am I doing? What could I be doing differently in this case? Ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Good of you to come. What should I have avoided? I should have avoided closing my body language because whenever a human being closes their body language, it is a sign that they feel threatened in one way or another. 
So I should have continued with an open body language. So let's have a look at number 69, which looks like this. I'll have to start up here. So when a presenter starts like this, they go, what should I do better now? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to one of the most influential subjects known to mankind. Now, this will be super interesting. We'll be going through this. You'll be having an amazing time. Wow, it'll blow you away. What should I have avoided? Reversing. Look what a double incorrect looks like. It looks like this. Ladies and gentlemen, absolute pleasure to have you here and good of you to come. Well, a double correct looks like this. Ladies and gentlemen, an absolute pleasure to have you here. Good of you to come. Is there a difference? Of course there is. The biggest difference is in here. I can feel a difference while doing those two versions. You become what you are. Now let's uh, ask ourselves, yeah, but David, the close body language things, what shall I do with my hands? What shall, how, where shall I put them? And the interesting thing with the close body language is that Wherever I went, all over the world studying these people, it seems like we've got a general kind of locked body language positions. And I'll show you my favorites that I found. We've obviously got the classical fig leaf position. Then we have the double bunny position. You have the right bunny position, the left bunny position, the right hockle, the left tackle. Then you have the forklift. You, of course, have the peacock with flapping elbows. You have the major, the merkel, the prayer, and the beggar. Uh, one of my personal favorites is the, the British horse rider. And the British horse rider, uh, it look, it's a person who holds their hands like this, puts it just above their chest, and it's, it's like they're off somewhere. Oh, God, there's a fox over here. And then we found two T-Rexes as well in the study. <laughs> Such a weird thing, presenting like this or like this. Okay, so, so you mean, David, that we need to have an open body language? Yeah, that's what I mean. And I'm not allowed to have them in my pockets, not allowed to have them in my major or the double bunny? No. But what on earth shall I do with them then? What you should use them for is what is called functional gesturing, to show that something is getting better, or that something is getting less good, or that it's one, two, three, four, five that we are going to go through. Use your gestures for what they're supposed to be used for. And what's interesting with this is that if you imagine the time we've spent on this planet as our race, how much of that time have we spent using gestures and nonverbal communication in order to communicate what we're saying? Is that more than verbal? Absolutely. Give me, let me give you a demonstration of how important it is. So I'll say something now. And everything I say will be super positive. My facial expressions will be super positive, And the way I say it will be super positive. But my hands will be saying the opposite. Are you with me? Because this requires some focus. All of you should learn more about public speaking, because if you do that, you will become better. You will grow and you will develop as a human being. People will love your presentations, listening to your arguments, and just generally loving whatever you're doing. So do yourself a great favor, learn more about this particular subject, because you'll be thanking yourself for the rest of your life. And particularly you have been absolutely incredible, so I thank you for listening here. Thank you. Now the question is this, did you listen to what I was saying or what I was doing? I believe that you focused entirely on what I was doing, and that is the case with body language and gestures. If it's not saying the same thing as what you're saying verbally, there's a discrepancy and a disturbance in the communication. Let's move on from body language to a couple of tips on voice. And the first one I'm going to give you is about pace. So listen to this. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to take you through now is incredibly important now and for the rest of your future life. We'll go through the cortex, we'll go through the limbic and the reptilian system. We'll go through a psychological advanced profile where we'll tell you, take you through the entire steps of the structure. We'll then look at how that relates to Aristotle, Ethos, Logos and Pathos, and I'll carry on in this pace. Compare that to this. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to take you through something that is entirely and utterly boring. Something that you will have no use of in your entire life. And every second spent listening to me now and on will be a waste of time. 
And then I look at your faces, you're like, whoa, that last bit. I want more of that. That was super interesting. The useless stuff. Yeah, and I don't want the brain so much. I want the, the second bit. Why? Because your brains, they react to when a person has a low pace, you think that what I'm saying is more important than when I have a high pace, because that illustrates that I don't really want to be there. There are exceptions to this rule, but that is the basics. So keep a calm pace. My next tip goes on pauses. The pause. Is the pause important? Absolutely it is. So let me give you a classical rhetorical proverb. Now, without pauses, and it goes like this. Did you know that every single decision you've taken in your entire life and will take for the rest of your life is based on one thing and one thing only? If you give that to the people listening to you, that is the feeling. That is what will move them. Now I'll add pauses. And it sounds like this. Did you know that every single decision you've taken in your entire life and you will take for the rest of your life is based on one thing and one thing only? And that is an emotion. Now, if you give that emotion to the people listening to you, they will take the decisions you want them to take. Is there a difference? Absolutely. But you know what? Some people are afraid of the pause. So they go like, whoa, am I going to do one of those? I'm not. I refuse. I, uh, I prefer to compromise. And do you know what the compromise for a pause is? What does it sound like? Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 it's like a scock of sheep when you listen to certain conferences. Uh, Now, there's nothing among these 110 skills that lowers your ethos and your credibility more than uh, because it signals that you don't know what you are saying and where you're going in your talk. So let me give you a demonstration. Did you know that every single decision you've taken in your entire life and will take for the rest of your life is based on one thing and one thing only? And that is a feeling. Uh, uh. <laughs> I think you prefer the one with the silence. Now those were the five main skills I wanted to take you through. And if you haven't used them before and you start using them as a public speaker, they will make a difference to your speech. I'd like to treat you to four small skills as well, just to give you an appreciation of how small a skill can be, but still have a great impact. And it looks like this. <laughs> and those were the four skills. Did you follow them? Number one, as I looked up, which illustrates that I'm thinking which increases your, your sense of presence for me on stage. The second thing I did was that I did an audible inhale, which makes your brain believe that I'm going to say something that's exciting. I then combined that with a Duquesne smile, which means that I smile with my mouth and with my eyes. Did you fall for it? Because what I did as well was this. <laughs> I did self-laughter. And also that increases anticipation of what I'm going to say. So four small skills executed in five seconds changes the state of your mind. Now I'd like to pick out one of those and just end off with that. And that is the Duquesne smile. Duquesne smiles has in studies shown that you are more likely to be married, less likely to be divorced. You're happier, you're more content with life. And you actually are more relaxed in situations like this. So I asked myself, am I a Duquesne smiling person? And to figure that out, I walked over to my computer and I logged in and I looked at all my 60,000 Google photos. They're not all of me, but 
of family members and others. I looked at mine and it seemed like my brain required short of a miracle to do a Duquesne smile. You know, where you smile with your entire face. I thought, that's not fair. And considering the psychological benefits, I better learn this. So I spent not four, but six months learning how to do a Duquesne smile. And suddenly my brain was launching Duquesne smiles in just everyday happiness. It's beautiful. And I felt happier as a human being. I want to show you what it looks like. Now, every time I go on my summer holidays, I, uh, I take a photo of myself. And these were the last years of those photos. This was 2014. There's no Duquesne smile. 2015, definitely no Duquesne smile. 2016, still no Duquesne smile. 2017, no Duquesne smile. This year, Duquesne smile. Does it make a difference? Absolutely. It brings joy to you and stability to me. Now we've come to the end of this talk and I would like to end with um, something that relates to boxing. You know, Muhammad Ali and the likes, they have combinations for when they're going to strike somebody, knock out. And the same kind of combinations exist in public speaking as well. So what I'd like to show you is this combination. I'm going to start with a number 34, go to number 8, and then we'll carry on to 69 and 98 to 67 and 18, 22, and a 101 and 21. Are you ready for the combination? Okay, looks like this. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you've had fun, that you have learned, but more than anything, I hope that you feel inspired to become a greater public speaker. Because anybody can become good. Anybody can become great. And everybody can become outstanding. Because it all comes down to one single thing. So I hope you enjoyed that video. I just want to go through some of the hand gestures that David uh, J. Phillips actually talked about, okay? And there are actually some of them that he, he didn't even talk about, though. But if you watched him, you saw his hands do these things here. So, for example, uh, if you have your hands down, like so, okay, uh, this expresses that you're certain about something, okay? So you're assertive. You know uh, what you're talking about. Here, with your hands open like this or like that, you know, okay? Uh, yeah, so it's, this is uh, an association with truth and honesty. Here, if you put your hands up a little bit, but not like the dinosaur, okay? You're confident in yourself, okay? So it's it's like a display of, well, it says here, power. I don't know if you can read that. Uh, it reflects, you know, higher order thought processes like problem solving. Okay, here we are. I have a big idea, okay? Yeah, okay, so it's something, it, it communicates your enthusiasm to other people. One hand up, okay, for example, then this is the way it is. So it shows that the idea is rigid, uh, there, you know, it's unwavering precision, physically grounding, okay, the, the message for the audience. Okay, so you want to use it, it says right here, to make a practice point, or sorry, a precise point, or show your strong stance, okay, postoy, on a topic, okay? All right, so you're, you're in agreement with something. Here, we can say, I mean it from the bottom of my heart, okay? Yeah, honesty, honesty, okay? So when you truly believe in what you're saying and want to convey that, you want that message to go, uh, you know, you need to express that to your audience. 
Okay, and then finally we have finger counting. Although uh, David J. Phillips uh, used his hands more like one, two, three, four, five. Okay, but you can, if, it, if you don't want to show so much emphasis, okay, you can also use your, your fingers, okay? So it's like a nonverbal anchor, okay? That uh, kotva that I talked about earlier then, okay? So it helps people follow along when you have several uh, key items to, to highlight, okay? So one, two, three, four, he also talked um, about some really cool stuff about using your, your voice as well, okay? So remember, like when you use, uh, he, he talked about pauses, for example. Pauses, um, you know, allow the, the audience to think, okay, about each point, okay? So it gives emph or emphasis to everything that you, you have to, to say, okay? If you start talking quieter, okay, a little bit lower, it's anticipation, okay, so you're expecting something, okay, something is going to happen, okay. Let's move on here. I, I want to move on to the uh, attire, uh, attire part, and uh, basically the woman is going to describe to you uh, what you should wear during communications trainer and personal stylist, my participants often ask me, what should I wear for my presentation? Everyone's going to be looking at me, so I want to look good, but I've got to feel comfortable and confident. Hi, I'm Sharon Tabois with Lighthouse Communications. Let's talk about the three C's to remember when deciding what to wear when presenting. The first C, culture. Consider the culture of your audience or company. Will you be presenting at a corporate, business casual, or less formal environment? If you work for a company where a t-shirt and jeans are the norm, consider wearing a dark wash pair of jeans and a button-down shirt, or even a polo shirt in your company's color to amp up the look. The second C is color. Do you have a color that when you wear it, you immediately feel more confident? Or maybe you even have a signature color. Or it could be that color that when you put it on, even strangers around you comment on how fantastic it looks on you. If you don't have such a color just yet, Consider your hair color, your skin complexion, and your eye color when deciding what looks best on you. Try experimenting with jewel tones like ruby red because they look flattering on most all complexions. If you know that there's a strong possibility that you're going to sweat when you're nervous in front of your audience, opt for either extremely light or extremely dark colors. Also consider the fabrication of your garment. Choose something natural and absorbent like cotton. That way, Potential pit stains or sweat marks will not prevent you from gesturing freely when you want. If you know that you're going to be recorded, opt for wearing solids as opposed to prints. Yeah, I am wearing a bold print right now, so bold prints are okay, but you do want to stay away from really fine lines, thin pinstripes, because they could create a Mori effect on camera. Check out the two links below for more information on what to wear and what not to wear when you know you're going to be filmed. The final C is comfort. You want to make sure that you're choosing clothes that fit comfortably, properly, and are also flattering for your body type. Imagine how uncomfortable you could be if you wore something that was too restricting or something that was too loose that it was falling off your shoulder. In addition to being very distracting for your audience, it can also prevent you from really being able to focus on your content, which is the whole reason why you're there. It's pretty common to get warm when presenting, so it's a good idea for you to have a finishing layer that you can easily remove in case you get hot. Finishing layers are things like a cardigan or a blazer, but you want to make sure that you don't have too heavy of a finishing layer that will prevent you from being able to gesture easily in those moments that you want to add impact to your content. Definitely put some thought into which shoes you're going to wear when presenting. We walk a little bit differently with each pair of shoes, so be sure that the shoes that you choose will allow you to feel stable and grounded. Ask yourself, will I rock in place with discomfort because these are new shoes that I haven't broken in yet? And ladies, if you're choosing to wear heels, make sure the heel height isn't too high for you to be able to maintain a confident posture for the entire length of your presentation. So there you have it, the three C's to remember when deciding what to wear when presenting. These three C's will really help you to feel more confident walking into that next high stakes situation. If there are other factors that you have, feel free to comment down below.
So you kind of get the idea of what to wear. You know, you want to be appropriate for the audience, okay? So whether it's going to be a formal, okay, or informal, if it's just going to be for your colleagues, uh, even if it's a, a business presentation. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of business also involved, um, you know, in science and, um, and so forth. So sometimes, I mean, if you have a proposal or you need to give a presentation, uh, to a company to, for, you know, to fund you or, or something like that, uh, then by all means, you need to do that, that research. Uh, I want to go back to the, the book, actually, okay, on, on attire, okay? So, uh, if you go to page 73, okay, there is, you know, just a, a very, very uh, short quiz, okay? Uh, think about it. Like, uh, do you put sunglasses on if the room is too bright? Well, of course not. But what about a polo shirt? Okay, you know, like Tiger Woods or something. Okay, again, you got to think of the audience. If it's for de defending your thesis, no. But if it's for our class, yeah, it's probably okay. Uh, be careful about mini skirt, okay? Uh, TL call, anything that is uh, revealing. So no matter how hot it is, okay, you have to be very, very careful. You don't want to be too liberal. Uh, try to dress on the conservative side, okay? Um, if you are uh, wear folklore clothing, like, for example, maybe your presentation is about Brinza cheese, uh, then maybe, yeah, folklore clothing, you know, the Kroy, uh, something like that, you know, Valashka, you know, uh, it could work. I've seen, you know, like if you're like, I, I've seen people do presentations even in a laboratory coat. OK, they showed up uh, because they were in their role uh, as, as a laboratory technician. OK, the laboratory experiment and so on okay be careful of all the this other stuff all the accessories like a baseball cap don't try not to wear any hats okay uh, a tie some people wear ties okay but you can see that even david j phillips did not wear a tie it's very common these days to be tieless okay you can wear, yeah, okay, you can wear Converse baseball or basketball trainers, even if you're wearing a suit, okay? Uh, me personally, I don't look good in this combination, but some people do. Um, you can wear high heels if you're not going to be walking too much. If you're, if you're shorter in stature, in uh, uh, statue, then yeah, okay, if you want to, if, if it makes you more confident, uh, then go for it, okay? That's completely up to you. So, yeah, it, there is no right uh, or, or wrong answer, uh, well, maybe for some of them, but... <laughs> you okay, then, so uh, the next thing, or the last thing for today's lecture, then, uh, I just want to go through some problems and uh, I'm just going to show you it in the book and uh, if you'd like uh, you can do them for homework actually okay so uh, basically what I, what I want you to do there's there's I think about four or five different problems and I want you to choose one of the problems send me an email okay all you have to do is write you know two or three lines one two three three lines and uh, and basically tell me what is your solution to the problem okay so let's look at some of the what would you do if your presentation begins at nine o'clock 9 a.m. it is now 905 and people are still trying or, or they're still walking into the classroom and they're looking for uh, a place to sit. Okay, Th this happens to me very, very often when I'm, you know, I'm beginning a class uh, or, uh, you know, a talk about something. Okay, you're trying to begin, but the door keeps opening and closing because of a late audience, uh, late audience member. Okay, what would you do? 
Okay, so if you'd like, send me an email. That would be great. I'm very curious as to you know what you would say for you know for this one here. And scenario two. Okay, so you are midway. You are halfway through your presentation, and suddenly you can hear somebody snoring. Okay, rapat. They're snoring very loudly. Everybody is aware of this. Okay, what do you do? Somebody has fallen asleep, so. Look at scenario number three. Oh, I hate it when this happens. A cell phone begins to ring and the female audience member cannot find the phone in her handbag. She is looking everywhere for her phone, okay? and uh, it's taking her a long time to find it and turn it off um, yeah oh scenario number four this is very often my problem too you didn't have breakfast and your stomach begins to make loud noises okay so your your brucha jaludok vracha oh and and it's very quiet in in the room and then finally in scenario uh, five okay this is something also that you need to get uh, used to and it, it will happen no matter how good your presentation is. But some individuals in the audience, they, they will leave early, okay? Maybe they have to, okay? Uh, but this is causing you to forget where you are during your, your presentation. It's um, a distraction. Uh, okay, so what do you do when this happens? Somebody is standing up and they're you know they're leaving and you know you you can't almost you almost can't help just watching them leave the room okay in fact every a lot of people turn their heads and they watch that person uh leave the room okay so you have to be careful of, of that sort of uh you know that that attraction to to also watch that person all right then. So I hope um, yeah I, I, I hope this was helpful for for you guys today. Then uh, I'm going to leave the pre the um, the the lesson at, at that and basically just going to say goodbye to you and uh, take care. I really want you to think about the face-to-face uh, -face presentations. This is just my idea and my suggestion. I I think it would work great. I know a lot of people really don't like doing uh, video presentations but um, you know it, video presentation is extremely important you know to talk into a camera like I'm doing now to even have to stop the presentation time to time erase everything and and then do it again from the beginning so okay all right everybody okay remember keep that that you know that, that Duquesne smile that uh, that that David J. Phillips was talking about too. Smiling is really, really important. You know, show the teeth. You know, it takes a lot of practice. Okay. All right. Bye bye, everybody.